The title of this brief talk is Telehealth Group Counseling, but most of what I'll say also applies to group psychotherapy as well as group support meetings. In order to get this right, group facilitators need to be fairly knowledgeable about telehealth and group counseling. And that's just the beginning. Telehealth with groups can be a huge can of worms, but can also be very rewarding and cost-effective when we get it right. I'd like to spend a couple of moments on administrative concerns and then focus on the nuts and bolts of actually doing counseling groups using a telehealth platform. Some jurisdictions have relaxed the ban on the use of non-HIPAA compliant options like Zoom, Facebook, and Skype during the COVID-19 crisis. But that doesn't remove the liability that your agency may incur if someone breaches security and compromises client confidentiality. Our suggestion? Use a telehealth solution that has HIPAA compliant security already wired in. You're going to want to have an informed consent agreement with your clients that discuss the pros and cons of group counseling via telehealth. That consent should include a clear understanding that you or your agency can't be held liable for a breach of confidentiality on the part of one of your group members. Obviously, you can control what you do or say, but controlling what a member of your group of 14 or 4 might say just isn't possible. Your treatment agreement should include an understanding that each member will be in a private location and that no one will record or take a screenshot during the group meeting. This next item may seem picky, but I'd suggest against having pets in anybody's room during a group session. Sometimes pets fight, and sometimes they are distractingly cute, but rarely do they share helpful insights. Often pets hijack session, and it will take a while to get back on the topic. When you're screening and selecting group members, think about the client's quality of fit in terms of their clinical appropriateness. And then think about the fit between the technology available to them and the requirements of telehealth. Many up-to-date telehealth solutions tap into the power of a client's smartphone. Other platforms require a computer with a webcam and microphone, or a laptop, or a tablet with an internet connection that has upload and download speeds of at least 10 megabits per second. Sorry, that was a mouthful. Our suggestion? Smartphones are often a better option because they are usable almost anywhere and have both video and audio seamlessly integrated and ready for use. You probably want to make the technology side of telehealth just as easy as you can for the client. You need to question if there is a secure, quiet place for them to do the telehealth group, either where they work or where they live. Frankly, it's amusing to me how often clients use a walk-in closet, a bathroom, or their car for sessions because that's where they're least likely to be interrupted. A day before each group, I send out a notice inviting members to join the group at a specific date and time. If the group will be addressing a theme or a topic, I let them know what the topic will be. Something like well, self-regulation, challenges in early recovery, or perhaps dealing with traumatic memories. Many times it's a good idea to either send clients a handout or a podcast on the topic to stir up a bit of interest about expanding their knowledge or skills. I send out another message just prior to the start of the group to remind members that the group is about to begin. Hopefully, your telehealth solution provides you with the ability to send group participants meeting reminders that put the group session on their electronic calendar and allow you to send an array of resources. In a similar vein, having your clients complete a psychological screening tool like the PHQ-9 or GAD-7 prior to some groups may give you information about their needs that may alter your treatment approach. If these screenings are available, and scored within your telehealth platform, that's ideal. To ensure that your group members are on an equal footing, you need to be certain that members are signing in with a device that includes both a mic and camera. While it's technically possible to have a client join the group by phone, they won't be visible to their peers, so you can't visually verify that they are who they say they are. Reimbursement for sessions by phone may not be allowed by many health insurance programs. If you can't verify the identity of a client, 
you probably need to remove them to preserve the confidentiality of everyone else. Combining clients on phone and video sessions just seems like a bad idea. When a group is formed, it's a good idea to review group rules to cover topics like confidentiality, attendance, security, and the responsibility of being a group member. Any time that a new member joins, you'll want to review the rules again. Now, if you've done groups in the past in your office, you've known that you've got a lot of control over that environment, but now the risks to a breach in confidentiality are multiplied by the number of environments into which your clients reside. It's really ideal if you can get your clients to use earbuds or a microphone headset combination to ensure privacy and eliminate any audio feedback that can be incredibly distracting during a group session. Tell your members to find a stable place for their smartphone or the webcam. Now, some members may want to hold the phone. Frankly, the motion is just too distracting and becomes really annoying. Have your client seated with the camera in a stable position with good lighting. If they aren't using an external mic or a headphone mic combo, they need to be fairly close to their device. You probably want to let your clients know that if the connection fails, they ought to exit and then try to re-enter the session. If that doesn't work, ask them to stay off their phone and wait for directions by email, text, or phone. Just like in regular group therapy, all members may not be appropriate for the group. So you may need to remove people who aren't a good fit or if they don't have the hardware that allows their active participation. We typically suggest that you instruct your members to use the chat feature only for technical problems. It's just too distracting for a facilitator to have to pay attention to the group process and respond to non-essential texts at the same time. With some client groups, you may have group members from the same sober living facility or a residential treatment center who think it might be a good idea to share one device. I'd recommend that they be on their own device rather than try to share one, and ask that they be in separate rooms. It's really a must to have a private location to ensure their privacy as well as the confidentiality of all group members. In some settings, your client might want to lock the door and or put a sign of the door to ensure privacy. It distracts the entire group if someone enters a member's room during a session. In addition to the distraction, it makes the whole group experience feel less safe. If the group is hearing feedback caused by a microphone picking up sounds from a speaker that is too close or too loud, you may be able to minimize this by having the member lower their speaker volume or have them switch to a headphone. You may need to ask that group members use the mute function when they aren't speaking if there is some unavoidable background noise. I usually recommend co-therapy as a model for group counseling in telehealth. Having the additional counselor, coach, or support worker will be useful to help a client with technology issues while the other facilitator conducts the group. If there's only one facilitator, members who struggle with technology issues will absolutely distract from the functioning of the whole group. Even if things are running smoothly, it's often a good idea for one group facilitator to take primary responsibility for running the group while the other one takes observational notes and adds insights. If you've been doing group therapy for a while, you're probably very aware of different models for groups, like psychoeducational groups, groups that are oriented toward skill development, CBT or problem solving groups, support groups and interpersonal process groups, or some hybrid of the types that I've just mentioned. No matter what type of group you're leading, telehealth can work nicely, but different types of groups do require different adaptations. As a face-to-face -face group facilitator, you're no doubt aware of how frequently you shared printed handouts and how often you used a whiteboard to make some points during a group. Unless all of your members have signed on with a computer that has a sufficiently large screen, this kind of sharing just doesn't work very well with telehealth. As we noted earlier, I like to send out resources ahead of time. Members can review the resource 
or clients can print them out for use during the group. I almost feel I need to apologize because I've given you a whole lot to think about in a really short period of time. But please know that there's a lot to be gained by giving your clients the opportunity to learn and gain support within a group format. The landscape within the field of behavioral health is quickly evolving. Technology is allowing us to connect with clients across vast distances. Telehealth platforms permit us to invite clients into sessions. They provide instantly scored behavioral health screenings. They share a variety of resources, and we can interact in ways that are increasingly powerful. Well, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Mark Rohde, the Chief Clinical Officer at True Mobile Health. If you've got any feedback on this presentation or any other telehealth topic, or if you're just interested in learning more about using our platform, please be in touch with us at, you guessed it, truemobilehealth.com. Bye, thanks for now.